And then there's the one scene where he freaks out and is angry about um, him not doing his homework, but it's only because he loves him so dang much. And welcome back to No Script, an unscripted conversation about theater's best scripts. I'm Jackson Nikolai. I'm Jacob Mann Christensen. Welcome, everybody. We're glad to have you back. And we are on the cusp of an exciting, uh, I was going to say season, but that's a little confusing because we (laughs) use season for other things. We're on the cusp of an exciting period in No Script uh, time, uh, 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 life. Uh, yes, yes. Boy, this is this is getting a little jumbled. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting though. It's it's because it's exciting. Um, we've got uh, sure. we wanted to like right away at the start of the show, kind of highlight one of the big kind of beats of No Script's uh, life in its season. Uh, those who are longtime listeners of the show know that we like to have the kind of traditions during each season. And oftentimes we have a guest episode and oftentimes we do a themed month every season. Um, and uh, this season is no exception. We are coming right up to our themed month here and we are doing uh, 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 another take at, at, at a season that we really liked called Mini Month and we're calling this one just Mini Month Part 2. Mini Month Part 2. So, in the original Mini Month, we visited four plays that you would call one acts, or maybe you would call short plays. These were plays that were longer than, you know, the genre that we call 10 minute plays, but they were not long enough to be called the genre that we call full length plays. This all gets. Harry and gray and, <laughs> yeah, and the rules are sort meh. of <laughs> sort of nebulous but I do remember that the last time around we we were able to have some sort of broader conversations around sort of what what is a short play how does it work in context of of having an evening of live performance what would it mean to pair short plays together is that the intention when you write a piece of uh, a short dramatic literature so we'll see what this month of conversations brings but our feeling was hey you know short plays there are uh, many of them out there uh so why not come back to this form and visit four more short plays so that's the plan across the next month. This is the month of April. If you listen along with us in real time, we will be discussing four short plays and we'll see what kind of conversations those plays lend in conversation with each other. Yes, yes. Uh, excited for the chance to engage it again. It's not a format that we often work into kind of our full seasons because, again, shorter plays. Um, oftentimes, uh, yeah, yeah. So we're oftentimes doing kind of longer ones. So excited to get to jump into this format again. And just the sort of like the, 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 I don't know, restriction uh, often produces such like powerhouse. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. And so, so exciting to kind of jump into those scenes. So get excited for that. Um, uh, that's coming out soon soon next week right or is it the week after next week <laughs> next, next week, week yep. we divide we dive into uh the first of our four short plays if you are a patron of course you already know what those four short plays are that is one of the benefits we'll talk about that in a minute but if you don't know at this point it's something to consider when we get around to our discussion of patreon but that is what's happening next week and this week is its own exciting episode It's true. Yes, yes. So get excited for that for next week. But this week, we're jumping into another great conversation about one of theater's best scripts. Um, uh, We're talking today about God Said This by Leah Nanako Winkler. That's right. This is a a great little family drama with some really interesting things that happen. This is a play, as we'll discuss when we get to the synopsis, uh, about a family dealing with cancer. Uh, about what that is like for a family, especially in this case, an estranged family. This is one thing that occurred to me as I was reading this play that is going to stick with me for a minute, I think, is 
this is going to sound weird when I first say it, but stick with me. <laughs> Go for the There's ride. not enough cancer plays. Hmm. Like, like for as prevalent an experience that dealing with family cancer is, and because we know that one of the roles of art in our world is to give us a sort of meaning-making experience about the real events of our life, and cancer is one of those prevalent, awful things that touches so many of our lives, perhaps all all of our lives. I mean, in America, cancer might be one of the most universal experiences in America. Boy, that's weird to say. Yeah, that's I'm weird. Yeah. Not sure if mm-hmm. I've ever thought about that. But there's there's just not a lot of cancer plays. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I guess I know why. They're pretty sad. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And pretty sad, pretty, pretty like, uh, again, because of that maybe commonality, if people aren't kind of aware that they're going to see one, it's kind of a big theme (laughs) to kind of hit you out of nowhere with, which maybe is a good note for today. We'll we'll talk about a couple scenes um, in this play that kind of deal pretty directly with the trauma that a family goes through um, uh, while going through a family member going through cancer. So be aware of that as you engage this episode. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 I, I agree, actually. I think, I think, uh, the, the, the theater, theater's ability to kind of communally share a story is well served for this subject matter. Um, so, so yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a play that's going to deal with that. I'm excited for that conversation because I think it, it really uses theater quite well to do that. Um, uses its medium quite well to do that. No, I agree. I think this will be an interesting time, and it's a very interesting play, uh, one that maybe a lot of you out there haven't heard of. So we are, as always, uh, excited about the part of our mission that is introducing you to really strong scripts that you just may not have heard of yet. And this, this is your chance to get a first introduction to this play. Before we get there, though, we do want to invite everybody listening to consider heading over to patreon.com slash no script podcast. That's all one word, no hyphens, no underscores patreon.com slash no script podcast over there you can become a supporter of the show this is how no script works we are not uh, in in the way that at least the, the the control that we have over how the podcast gets distributed we do not run a particular set of ads we are not you know this this podcast doesn't exist to be a an ad revenue generating platform for us it is is a joy in our lives. It is, I think, a, a useful and unique experience. And the only way that it can happen is through the support of the people over on Patreon. They have gone over to that website. They have chosen to support financially the running of No Script. And we are so, so, so grateful. Uh, we've set up our Patreon to be, I think, really accessible to anybody that feels like they want to give just a little bit to make a show like this happen. The lowest tier is a dollar a month. That, that We think that is very affordable for virtually everybody out there to consider giving just a dollar a month, $12 over the course of the year. And that dollar a month is very helpful. We, we love to do this podcast, but as anybody who's started a podcast knows... It, it's just there's almost no way to do it for free, and especially not in the way that we do it. Um, there are podcast hosting fees. There's getting access to the scripts. There's the time that we put into doing this show that we're not putting into, like, paying jobs. It is something that it costs money to run, and it just wouldn't be possible without the people over on Patreon. We're super grateful to those of you who are supporting us. There's higher tiers than a dollar a month, of course. Uh, we would not be very wise to, to stop it at a dollar a month because we know <laughs> many of you out there want to give more than that, and we're grateful for that too. But that dollar a month, great place to start, super, super, super helpful. And again, I just want to emphasize it couldn't happen without the folks on Patreon. So thanks to you over there. If, you're not, if that's not you yet, please consider it patreon.com slash no script podcast and we will see you over there yes indeed i'll add my thanks to the patrons who've already made the journey over there thanks so much and we'll see you over on patreon.com slash no script podcast and now back to the script here we go jumping into the conversation around god said this by leah nanako winkler um 
Uh, just going to give you a short introduction to uh, uh, Winkler as a playwright, um, uh, as this is the first time we're doing one of her plays on our show, um, which is very exciting. Um, uh, Winkler is a Japanese-born American playwright. Um, she is currently in New York City and kind of working out of there. She got her education, her MFA at least, from Brooklyn College in 2018. And then she like kind of started her own theater company in New York and started producing plays out of that theater company. And uh, uh, and and this this uh, this uh, kind of led to a, a, a long stint of plays from like you know 2007 all the way up to uh, 2018, 13. Sorry, 20. 2013 um and uh and she's continued to kind of uh win win more and more awards for these plays she uh has a samuel french short play festival award truman uh fellowship in creative writing as well as uh this play which won the yale drama series prize um so a, a well lauded playwright um I believe the the uh, uh, last award she won it was in 2020, or at least on the list that I have is the, the Steinberg Prize in 2020. Again, 2020, a notable date for the theater community. Um, It'd be interesting so, to go through our the playwrights that we've covered and see how many of them have won the Steinberg Prize. That that seems to like keep coming up. As yeah, we look at contemporary living playwrights. Yeah, 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 definitely. This so this play, I'm gonna do just a little bit about the play before it because. Um, there, there is a play before it, at least historic in, in the timeline of this play. Um, the uh, uh, Winkler wrote a, a play called Kentucky, um, which deals with the same characters and the same uh, storyline. It's seven years before the action of this play. I had not read that um, play prior to reading this play, and I don't think my experience was significantly deterred as a result of having not read Kentucky. Um, but it's important to note, I'm sure that my experience would be, you know, enhanced by a, a previous interaction with these characters um but uh but but just to just to know that this this kind of family uh, uh has has a previous history within uh winkler's uh writing um uh, i believe it was two or three years before the writing of god said this that she wrote kentucky um, this play, though, God Said This, uh, was uh, originally written and developed at primary stages um, and then uh, also developed in the WP Theater Lab residency. Um, the, 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 uh, the play received its Humana Festival debut in uh, 2018. We get to say uh, Humana Festival again, which is great, um, uh, down in Louisville. And I did not know that before you just said that out loud, but that's <laughs> awesome. You just keep coming back, man. Back to the well. It's true. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. It's it's always great to find find plays that I have. The, you know, a whole anthology of Humana Festival. Love the Humana Festival. Great, great, great festival. Um, this play though, uh, uh had its uh, yeah the the world premiere at the 2018 Humana Festival was selected as one of the plays for that festival. Um, it then received its New York City premiere at primary stages in January of 2019. Um, and, uh, that's kind of the last, the last, uh, kind of big bullet point I have as far as like the life of this play goes. I'd be really interested to see, um, houses do this play because <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very, I would think accessible play. We've already talked about how the, how the subject matter is, um, uh, uh, very identifiable. It's something that people are familiar with to some degree. Um, so I'd be very interested to see this, this production done, um, and but that's kind of the uh, yeah the the kind of most of the the the, uh, the credits at least of this play twenty nineteen uh, early January or starting in January of twenty nineteen um, had its uh, kind of big New York debut production. Yeah, that was at the the Cherry Lane Theater in New York, and and if you you're able to look around and sort of see other smaller regional houses that have done it, um, the Duke's Bay Theater did a 2022 production. It looks like so it's some nice kind of. Uh, we would call them maybe smaller regional houses outside of that New York premiere at the the Cherry Lane Theater. But again, this this might be a play that is unfamiliar to you, the kind of play that maybe is not even on your radar in terms of a title. Sometimes there are those scripts that you're like, oh yeah, I I know I've heard that play talked about, but I've never read it. And, and we like to talk about those plays. And then we also like to talk about plays that perhaps you've never even heard of. Uh, all of that is part of our mission to <laughs> right. come to a really big variety of scripts and, and to just keep, keep having conversations about different kinds of drama. I will just give you a 
kind of a general overview of the plot of this play. This is certainly not a plot-heavy play. This is a play about characters in relationships with each other, hard relationships at times, um, and it's about the way that a common enemy in cancer can bring people, even in hard relationships, can can bring them together, but also the complications of bringing people who are estranged for good reasons together um, during during this kind of life crisis. So the family that we are here to spend time with is a family in Kentucky. Um, the play takes place at a cancer center in Lexington. Uh, but there is also a sense, I think, from this family that uh, this is this is kind of the big city to them. Uh, sorry for bopping my microphone, everybody. And <laughs> and that this is not this, this is a place away from their home. Let me say that. Um, and so they're 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 displaced a little bit by having to kind of live their life out of this room in the cancer center for a time across the four days of this play. The family is uh, James and Masako. They're both in their 50s, maybe their 60s. And then they have daughters, Sophie and Hiro. Um, this is, so this is a, a mixed race family, as the playwright says in their notes. Um, Masako is a Japanese immigrant who married someone from America. And so this is, a, I think, a really nice example of a play. That, I'll just read the playwright's note um, because I, I loved the way that they phrased this. And I thought that was a really nice point to consider, especially for folks that are programming seasons. Um, this is what the playwright says in their note. Give the uh, perform give give Asian American performers the opportunity to play deeply flawed, complex people who are different from one another, who are not defined by their race. Don't let any of these roles be stereotypes in costuming or makeup, and please no yellow face. Yeah, super super helpful uh, uh, way to kind of introduce the the script. I, I feel like we've had a couple of great plays in a row um, where where uh, the, the we get to kind of see the playwrights care for the cast and for the casting um and and how they they want this play to be represented well um uh for especially in the in the case of of folks who often end up playing roles that they're kind of like pigeonholed into so so great advocacy at the start of this script yeah i i think i totally agree i think there's sort of the twofold benefits is the the opportunity to give uh, Asian American actors the chance at these kinds of roles that's just not very common in the American theater, which is uh, a real criticism of the American theater. But then also the sort of sadness that there still has to be a note about not casting white people in these For sure. roles. Yeah. Can't cast them in yellow face. It's like, oh my gosh, I just cannot believe that that is still an issue to the degree that the playwright has to stick a note in there to say, Hey, Hey, for real, don't for real do this, this time. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yep. It's it, not that it shouldn't be obvious in the descriptions of the characters, right. but Hey, just so you know, don't do this. Yeah. Like, gosh, come on. You're killing me. Not the playwright, but the people that make this playwright's note necessary. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. Okay. So back to the play. Uh, <laughs> so, here, the, the broad story of what's going on is that Masako is the mother married to James. She has a very aggressive cancer. She is being treated with chemo now because of a, a surgery that she had to remove the tumors before the action of the play. The chemo now is trying to make sure that the cancer doesn't come back. It is an aggressive chemo because it is an aggressive cancer. She is very, very sick and her family has come together to be with her in these uh, hard days of chemo. They sort of take shifts sitting with her at the cancer center. Meanwhile, there's other stuff going on outside of it. The, the complication here is that, as I've said a couple of times, this is not like a uh, everything's great, we love each other so much kind of family. This is a family with a really hard past. Um, James was, uh, across a lot of his life, an alcoholic um, and a mean, uh, 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 pretty deep into it alcoholic. And so much so that he ended up with psoriasis, his liver started falling apart. Um, and then again, all this before the action of the play, he ends up 
uh, getting clean because he can't drink anymore because his liver has died, basically. Um, and he ends up trying to get on a transplant list. And then, sort of miraculously, once he quits drinking, his liver starts to grow back. So he doesn't end up needing the transplant. And he's, he's you know for the large part, healthy again, at least physically, um, but is still sort of re-pulling out his personality from the well of alcohol and sort of figuring out who he is now that he's sober. Of course, uh, you know, this is a play about a former alcoholic, which means that we know that there are some issues. Um, one of them, especially having to do with their children, who are now uh, adults, Hero and Sophie, uh, Hero apparently sort of fled home before the action play a long time ago, almost 14 years ago is but sort of my count, um, moved to New York away from Kentucky to escape the things that were going on in her house. She left her younger sister Sophie behind. So Hero is back from New York. She does not come home really ever. Uh, my understanding is that she hasn't been home in seven years, which was when her younger sister got married seven years ago, and then before that hadn't been home for seven years. So she does not come back to Kentucky, but she's here because her mother is sick. Sophie is a, uh, the character description describes her as a born-again Christian. I would just say that she's someone that found faith as an adult, um, in part through her marriage, and, and that, that has become important to her. Another one of those playwrights' notes is that this is not, uh, the, the, her Christianity is not designed to be the comic relief in this play. She is somebody that went through some really hard stuff and found faith, and that has kind of carried her out. Um, and, and it is important to her now, and she tries to share that with her family across the course of the play. James is uh, in, in Alcoholics Anonymous, of course. That appears several times through the play. He attends AA meetings um, and sort of... They're, they're a little bit of uh, helping us know what's going on in the world, uh, kinds of speeches that he gives at AA. So the conflicts that come up have to do with these characters, not, you know, this family that's not together very often, coming together, reconciling with their past. Um, Hero is, is really struggling to be back in this family environment. She goes out with a friend from high school um, named John. John is a single father who is, you know, working hard. He, he did some bad stuff in his youth and is uh, really working to sort of course correct his life um, and be a good father to his son. He and Hero, uh, they, they don't, they sort of almost have a romantic connection a couple of times, but really this is just uh, a, an old friend kind of relationship and he's her buffer for, for outside of the family. So that, I mean, plot-wise, that's really it. The family meets and has conflicts across various things. Um, some of the conflicts are that their the parents' house is really falling apart, and that causes a great deal of stress for their daughters. Some of the conflicts are that John, uh, James, rather, is really trying to rebuild a relationship with especially Hero, um, and that's not something the Hero is necessarily sure that she wants, and so there's conflict developed around that. Um, there is, of course, conflict developed around the fear that uh, the daughter's mother and that James' wife, Masako, is going to die. And that that is potentially one of those things that is on the horizon. There's conflict there. There's conflict due to the aggressiveness of the chemo and what that is doing to Masako's body. Um, at the end of the play, the family has a sort of nice moment, really the first nice moment of all of them together in the hospital room. You get the sense that maybe there is a path forward for this family to find some togetherness again after all these years and, and after all this hardship. The play ends with another moment of James at a uh, what we think is an AA meeting. Um, giving another one of his, what we think are his uh, AA sort of speeches, you know, hi, I'm James, I'm an alcoholic kinds of speeches. It becomes clear over the course of that um, speech that he's actually giving the eulogy at Masako's funeral, um, that she died between this last scene where the family's together and happy and this, this very final scene of the play. Um, he has a really lovely uh, speech there where he describes meeting Masako for the first time, um, and she sort of comes in and plays her younger self, uh, sort of ghosts as her younger self there. Um, and then the play ends with the, the father and his two daughters trying to figure out what is going to come next. That moment of meeting his his uh, wife, you know, all those years ago is uh, it's a 
kind of a moment in contention throughout the play. The daughters remark and sort of learn across the course of the play that they don't really know much about their parents, about their parents' lives. Um, and partially that has to do with, you know, the, the trouble in the household as they grew up. And uh, may, maybe it also just has to do with this family's personality and their hesitancy to share things with each other. So it, it's a the, the moment where James describes meeting Masako for the first time is a culmination of a lot of the play. It's not just a sort of, hey, be sad because she's now gone moment. But it is a, a real moment where we see the thing that they have potentially realized they missed across the course of the play. If you're confused about the plot, that's because there's just not much of one. This, I mean, truly <laughs> this is, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in the best, like this is a character and relationship based play. Each scene is a new negotiation of a relationship in this family. I think, you know, you understand the situation and then there's a lot of sort of mini negotiations within that hard situation. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're kind of, uh, uh um, Somewhat episodically, but not really. It's in a sequence of events, um, jumping across a uh, number of interactions. I believe over the course of like four days um, is the, is the scope of the play. So it's a pretty quick scope or like uh, moment in these characters' lives um, that they go through quite a bit of stuff. Um, so so good job <laughs> pulling it all together there. Um, uh, I, I think that that's the um, uh, the some of the some of the stuff that I really want to focus in on is some of the stuff we talked about. Uh, r right away um, in that sort of director's note at the beginning around stereotyping of characters and how this play actively works against stereotyping people. <laughs> Anytime you, you kind of start down the road of one stereotype or another, a, a character will speak up <laughs> most of the time uh, against whoever is also doing the stereotyping. A lot of the scenes with Hero and John have quite a bit of uh, like... Uh, Breaking the stereotypes of 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 both, but for both of them, um, uh, hero is this uh, kind of New York transplant. Um, uh, 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 John often calls her a, like an Eastern liberal, um, and John is kind of uh, consistently breaking the stereotypes of what we think you know, uh, a Kentuckian is, I don't know what you think a Kentuckian is. Um, but he, he would voice that, uh, he's expecting hero to think that he's kind of backwoods or, or hick ish. Um, uh, but he kind of over and over says, no, I have a master's and I'm taking care of my kid really well. And all the, all these things. So, so this, this play kind of consistently when bring, when it brings notices, uh, a stereotype, will kind of, uh, undermine that stereotype and provide a different lens through which to view it. No, I think that's definitely true. And I, and I think that it is the sort of um, people who neither make the, the perfectly best decision nor the absolute worst decision every time that sort of defines the interactions of this play. Uh, there, there's a great example of this from early in the script. The family is together in the hospital room. Again, I, that probably only happens this time and then the time at the end of the play where everybody's together and it's a full uh, sort of family scene, let's call it. Um, and, and the thing that happens in that scene is that they daughters agree to go over to the parents' house the next day and see James rock collection. It seems like one of the ways that he's been able to dig himself out of this pit of alcoholism is collecting these, you know, gorgeous, beautiful rocks. He's very heavily invested in Facebook communities now about rocks, about birds, about all kinds of stuff. Um, it's He's sort of rediscovering, like I said, that part of his personality that Misako remembers from when they were young before he started drinking. And um, so he invites them over. This is a, a big leap of faith for him, a big risk, because he knows that their relationship is not good and that, you know, at any point this might go wrong. But the, they agree, finally. Hero is resistant at first, but finally kind of gets group pressured into agreeing. And so it's set that they're going to go and see his rock collection the next morning. Then in between this scene and the next scene, there's a, a, an Alcoholics Anonymous speech where basically it must be from that night. He goes to AA and basically says how excited 
excited he is that his daughter, who never talks to him, has been gone for years, is going to come over and see his rock collection. Then the very next thing we get is Sophie and Hero at the hospital the next day, and the scene is basically, what the heck? Why didn't you go to this meeting we were supposed to have this morning? Sophie wanted her there because she wanted her to see how bad the house is. But there's this other level where it's like, we as the audience have the dramatic irony to know just how excited James was about this, that he shared about it at AA. And Hero says, and again, this is that sort of not neither the best nor the worst thing. She says, basically, I sorry, I just forgot. Like I, I was, I was doing other stuff. I just, I totally slipped my mind. And it's my sense that she's not lying there, that she didn't intentionally skip, you know, the the make the worst decision or the most hurtful decision to intentionally not go to this meeting with her father. But she also didn't make the most kind decision to, you know, really do everything to ensure she was there. She, you know. It's just this kind of thing in the middle where people make mistakes and hurt each other kind of decision. And and I think I think what this cap- this play captures so well is how many layers deep that goes. Cause, cause especially in family settings. So certainly, certainly the, 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 the layers that you just described, they're all happening. And that was like four layers that you just described in that one interaction. You also have the layer of Sophie being really personally hurt um, by Hero in that scene because she brings up in that scene why do you it, it, it turns out that Hero was out last night with John um, uh, they were they, she stayed out late with him talking about something um, so I don't believe that they ever like ever sleep together in this play I don't think that's in the action anywhere um, but they they were just out together late and she um, uh, comes back the next morning late and and a little hungover. Um, and this hurts Sophie because she kind of consistently says or says that uh, Hero consistently always has to have a man around when she comes home. And oftentimes in this sort of like uh, sort of like dating way that helps kind of draw her away from the family. So in that little interaction, you have like four, five, six layers of kind of familial hurt being expressed <laughs> um, uh, just just in that little moment. And none of it is, in, I, I agree with you. I don't think any of it, it was like intentional hurt. And yet actions made by each, everyone makes these actions uh, oftentimes for their, sometimes for their self-preservation or just to try to uh, address what they need um, that ends up hurting one of the other in, individuals in the family. Yeah, I think maybe one of the ways I would say it is that this play is really good at revealing the layers of expectation that like exist in long standing relationships. Like if you think yeah. about like meeting, you know, a stranger or somebody for a first date, like there's only a certain layers, there's only so many layers of expectation you can have if you don't know somebody well. But the more and more you know somebody well, the deeper those layers go about how, what you expect them to do, what you hope they will do, what would be best for you, what would be best for them. So you have that, that sort of deep layered relationship. And then you multiply that by the number of people in this family and by all of the complicating factors from their past. And one of the things that starts to become clear across the course of the play is how hard it would be for anybody in this family family to make, you know, a perfectly correct decision in in every circumstance. Not only because of the layers of com- of expectation from just long-standing relationships, but then you add in the complication of their traumatic past together, and then you add in the complication of Masako's, you know, d- terrible sickness and all of the stuff that that brings to it, and you sort of get a sense of uh, and and maybe some of you out there have felt this way in your family situations where it's like, I don't know what I could do necessarily to get it right for everybody all the time. I'm not sure what I could bring to the table that everybody would feel like I was meeting all of their needs and I was meeting my own needs at the same time. I'm not sure that's possible. And how to like share share the room with each other still, <laughs> like like yeah yeah the the you you have a bunch of different scenes in this play that like highlight that so well because they're also simultaneously as they kind of hold that struggle of I don't know how to show up to you in a way that you need they're also relearning each other 
um, pretty significantly. I think that's what that kind of seven years since Hero has been home sort of thing is, uh, is kind of the, the or uh, an igniter for, is this like, we haven't interacted with each other in a while, and we're all really different. We know for sure there's a lot of pain that we caused each other before. Um, and, and we're, and they're trying to kind of renegotiate how to interact. And a lot of that, um, centers around Hero and James. They especially are kind of doing this work in this play of like trying to figure out a new way to be in the same room with each other. Um, uh, and, and a lot of that kind of passive pain gets brought up in small little things, things like the, the rock collection is a moment where you're like, oh, maybe there's a bright moment where they're going to find something new. And then just, she forgets and she doesn't make it there. So he storms into the hospital. This, that, that scene just has a great crescendo of he, sto he storms into the hospital by the end, drops this bag of rocks on the table and says, I was going to show them all to you. I want you to take one back with you to New York. He happens to grab like a really valuable one that when she picks it, <laughs> He does. He winds up like recanting and not wanting her to take it with her, and just a, almost a whole page is in all caps <laughs> of the two of them just yelling at each other back and forth around this rock collection. Yeah, and that moment is such good writing too because they're not yelling about the thing they're mad about. Right. <laughs> they're like yelling about the rocks. They're like furious with each other about the specific rocks that are being chosen or not chosen. James has this whole like very angry speech where he basically is just describing one of the rocks in particular. Yeah. <laughs> but you can see like the fight that's really happening behind the fight about the rocks. I think it's interesting that it's not until very late in the play that we get this little quote. I'm going to read it for you. This is um, Hero and Sophie, who only don't have that many scenes together in the play. This, these are the sisters. And um, they're, they're sort of finally have this moment where they're able to have a kind of heart-to-heart. -heart. They're also smoking weed at the time. So this, this play maybe uses weed in the same way that other plays use alcohol. Yeah, so just yep. a heads up about that to, like, loosen the inhibition perhaps um, but they're having this discussion and and one of the things that they're talking about is that um, it it is, hero is part of this Facebook group that is uh, for families of people with you know really intense debilitating cancer and hero has found this really valuable so she added Sophie to the Facebook group to maybe help give her sister a way to deal with what's going on in their family but it, it has not had the same thing it has not been the same boon for sophie that it is for hero again that additional layer of complexity right what helps some people is really painful to others sophie basically just feels like she's reading story after story of people whose family dies and it's really traumatizing her so they're in the middle of this sort of heated argument and discussion about that about how sophie feels like she's being traumatized by the facebook group and hero responds with the story from their youth about how the, their father would basically go into these blind, drunken rages about the simplest thing and get really furious and mean with their mother. And she ends the, one of those stories, which I'm not going to read just for trauma porn's sake. You can check it out in the context of the play where it's much more fitting. But that story ends with Hero asking Sophie, was that traumatizing for you? Sophie said, no, that was normal. Hero says, see, I'm still traumatized by that. And this is why I can't forgive him. But Sophie, I need to forgive him. I need to forgive dad for the sake of mom in these moments to give her peace. And I know that, but I can't. How did you do it? I find that to be very interestingly located so near the end of the play. It feels like the kind of thing that is revealed at the beginning of the play in other plays and that you watch it develop. But it, to me, it almost seems like the admission of this is the moment itself. And that's why it's located after all of this action that we see that that maybe Hero hasn't is is not able to say that out loud and finally has. So that this is the culmination of a journey rather than yeah. the start of one. Yeah, and I think that does pay off in the following scene where they come into the room and the like the the directly subsequent scene I believe or the next scene that they're with their their mom and dad is is the one that is the kind of most touching that they've had in years um that they kind of share a little bit about their their life and and kind of have have a meaningful family moment and a lot of hope so i think that 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 uh 
analyze as well for that moment to have been this sort of uh, culmination of a journey for Hero. Also, the the the, the other piece that I, I love that moment because it, it so and I, and I don't have too much other than just my love for the moment to kind of talk about for it um, because it so uh, it's so good at showing the two different ways these two characters in Sophie and Hero experience their their moments of trauma and and it only works because uh, two or three scenes ago Sophie went through the thing that she describes as traumatic which is she is she helped her her mother uh, Masako go through a pretty awful moment in her cancer treatment she uh is feeling really nauseous she tries to go to the bathroom she ends up not being able to get to the bathroom in time and so Sophie uh helps clean up after her and goes through th- goes through uh, uh all all the the hard work it's a long moment of theater too it's a long moment of kind of uh blocking um that is kind of named as this should take a while as we kind of sit in the the heaviness of this interaction between these two characters and Sophie names that in that scene as like that that's traumatic for me. I it's 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 my mom. How am I supposed to take care of my mom in this way and she's kind of going through that. So in that scene you have the two of them having uh, yeah, late in the play, gone through and unpacked all of these moments or a couple of these moments, not certainly not all of these moments, but these moments that were uh, traumatic for them, that they're going through uh significant things and they don't know how to grapple with them. So just the sharing the, the moment of connection between those two and the sharing that, that goes on in this scene is just such a great payoff <laughs> for both the unpacking and the really hard, the hard, um, hard content that these, that these of, of the lives of these characters that they're going through as they're helping their mom with this cancer. Yeah. There's a moment earlier in the play that I, I really like too, that maybe helps set up for me some of the, to help me contextualize the hard relationships and and how they're fitting together in terms of a story that we're we're working with. This is one of the scenes where John and Hero are together. They have a lot of scenes together, maybe more than any other pairing in the play, if I'm just thinking off the top of my head. Again, John is Hero's like friend-ish from high school. Now they're in their late 30s. So you're, this is a long, long time ago, but they've reconnected because Hero's back in town. Again, Hero's family he accuses her of just sort of using people as buffers that she, whenever she comes back, she sort of makes an old acquaintance to use as a buffer between her and her family. You know, how true you think that is about Hero is up to your own devices, I guess, when you read or see the play. But certainly in the the function of John in this play in some ways is to give Hero a place to process the things that are happening in the other scenes uh, w- without having those layers of complexity that, that exist for her family. So they're they're driving around, um, and I, I'm I'm forgetting the specific context of what they're doing, um, but they're they're having a discussion basically about some of the people that they knew in high school, including a guy who ended up you know either high or drunk, getting in a car accident and kind of derailing his life. And this is the uh, this is the 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 the, the lines of dialogue. Um, John says, yeah, and he's a former addict, talking about this this old acquaintance of theirs. Yeah, and he's a former addict or an addict, depends on the year, totally a recluse. Hero says, God, sounds like he really effed up his life. She actually swears there. John says, it's really easy to F up your life, like really easy. If I wanted to F up my life, I could do it right now. But you know what's hard? Getting your shit together and getting a, uh, an effing master's degree. So that in that specific moment, he's talking about his master's degree, which he's really proud of because of all the things that happened in his life, including getting arrested at a young age, his own bout with, you know, substances. Um, and he sort of his son, he sort of grabbed his life by the horns, got a master's degree and is really doing well now. Uh, so that's the reference to master's degree. But what's in, more interesting to me is this note about how easy it is to mess up your life. And by contrast, how hard it is to get things together and to make life feel like it more ought to be or more is on the right track. And for me, that helps set up some of what this play is doing. I wonder if one of the things that we see, what one of the things that Winkler does, is show us all the places that this family relationship could get messed up again. 
and how easy that would be, how easy it was to fall into these patterns of attack and trauma, and how hard it is to get all that back, to to sort of point things back towards connectedness and forgiveness and togetherness. Yeah, yeah, the kind of slow hard work <laughs> that comes like the, the first beat of the work is the realization. It's not, it's not <laughs> nearly over at the point that you realize it, the long, slow work of these characters. And, and yeah, I agree that I think a lot of John and heroes interactions kind of, uh, serve as the, uh, 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 strophe anti-strophe of that. The two of them kind of working through, um, different beats in their life where they're where they're slowly pe- piecing together something that looks like a puzzle. They never. I don't think either of them really ever land at a full puzzle. <laughs> um, but uh, but they're they're trying to kind of hold together the pieces. Um, which which like right. Away, it's it's a great introduction to the characters. They they kind of set that up right away. Um, with their various expectations for each other in it because John John pretty immediately. Um, uh, names their relationship as 100% platonic. He backtracks to 99% platonic. Um, you have Hero kind of trying to negotiate what her expectations for the relationship are. And so so they, they just jump in right at the beginning of their relationship with this sort of engaging what their, uh, maybe their trauma or their history has determined is the way that they engage in relationships and are willing to kind of lean in and do the work around discovering how best to interact with each other as they process their different worlds. Yeah, John is such a... It's a strange character because I'm not sure what function he really serves in the story outside of as a sort of foil at some times and and a comfort at others to Hero. Like, after the action of the play, what, what role do you think John plays in Hero's life? I mean, I... I get the sense that she probably goes back to New York. Maybe things are a little more, uh, you know, forgiven or or just more positive in their family life together. But I I mean, the conclusion this play is not that like Hero moves back to Kentucky from New York, (laughs) reconnects with her family after. I mean, she's got a life. She's got a great job. She likes New York, so she's going back. Is my point. And so what? He, are they do they have they developed a really close friendship the, the playwright is very clear that it's not a romantic thing between the two of them so it's i mean it, as as a character that you know like has a journey that goes that starts before the play and goes after the play like i'm just not sure what how what's his role in connection with this family if yeah any, yeah, I I I think I agree with with your assessment that I at least at least from analysis of the script <laughs> it seems like Hero will be going back to New York and that they aren't going to she's not going to move back and they're not going to, you know, pursue a deeper relationship or friendship. Um I think I think perhaps they they still connect, but I think I, I was I was just paging through my 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 script one more time to try to find this to be one hundred percent sure. So I might be about to walk into something that I'm gonna wish that I hadn't later. Um, I think the last scene that they have together um, is actually John setting a boundary um, and saying, uh, "I will like I, I'm sorry, I can't hang out tonight. My my son and I are watching a movie together." Um, and so, so I think that that kind of hints at us that that whatever their relationship is, it's starting to kind of run run its course a little bit at least. Um, and and I think that's uh, doubled up by there. There was you know there's an opportunity at the end of the play which becomes this sort of funeral service um, uh, for John to make an appearance in it, and and he's not in that scene. Um, it's just it's just the family at the end of the scene. So I, I I think he 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 might belong in that echelon of characters that <laughs> including <laughs> yeah including some others that are mentioned in passing but those echelon of characters that kind of come through these this family's life and perhaps don't make it <laughs> into the rest of their story post this script. No, I think that's a great point. That I I do think you're right that the last scene with John it's a it's a scene on the phone because Hero has called him doing what she, I think it seems like she normally does, which is sort of seek out a way to process the thing that just happened with her family with somebody who's not in the family. And again, she has no 
connections to this area because she she's not back for seven years at a time. So this person is willing to do that with her. That sounds more manipulative than I think the relationship is, but just set the the connotation of that aside. Right. So she calls him to sort of see, you know, can we meet? Can we talk? What are we? Can we hang out? Whatever. And he says, "I'm watching a movie with my son tonight, and I can't. I'm sorry." And I I think you're right that that is an interesting. It, because John doesn't have any more action in the play, that's basically his, you know, final beat of whatever little journey John has been on over the course of this play. And it's a beat to privilege the people in his life that are the most important to him, in this case his son, who he said all along is the most important thing to me. Um, I, I don't know if that is a sort of a scene in which to say, hey, like, your family's important, hero, you should reconnect with your family. Or if it's about um, just uh, offering, like earlier in the play, John and Hero have a, a scene where they discuss like finding those things that give them individually joy hmm, and, mm-hmm. and making sure to hold on to those. And maybe it's less about a sort of prescription for family togetherness as much as it is like a reminder about the things that individually bring you joy and how that can sort of work its way into those layers of complexity that you have in deeper relationships. Yeah. yeah. And over and over, John has these scenes where he's like, or yeah, John has these scenes where he's like, I, 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 the kid just brings his son just brings me so much dang happiness. And then there's the one scene where he freaks out and is angry about um, him not doing his homework, but it's only because he loves him so dang much. Um, and so, so yeah, I he's think a that's a pretty that, good dad. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> he, he's a little bit, I will say, of like a golden boy character. A little and I've bit. I've been guilty of, of writing those through. before. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's when you write family plays, there's so much like, you got to fit in there in terms of, of conflict and past trauma and and all this stuff that there can be a temptation to, like, write a character who's, like, a little bit free of that. Right, <laughs> so it, right. You know, he has a past, too, but he maybe comes across as, like, a hair too perfect. But, right, you know, right. it kind of works in this play because what really – here's what I'll say. What really works about it is that Hero and he don't end up romantically together. I think right. that would be the thing that would make me go like, oh, she found this perfect guy. You know, it's, it almost becomes Hallmark at that point. Right, 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 right. A woman from New York comes back to her <laughs> tough family situation in Kentucky and meets the perfect single father, you know? And yeah, the playwright yeah. is like, very clear, like, that is not what is going on. Right, subverting do that. not do that. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> We're, we're, we're coming down close to the end of the time. I, there's one other element. I don't know how short this is going to be, but um, there's one other element that I just wanted to bring up. Um, I, we've, we've kind of talked about all these mini arcs that, that these characters are going on. So it's not really um, I don't I don't know that it's helpful or, or it's possible or helpful to name a protagonist in this play. In some ways, it's how they're all interacting with each other. And yet the two characters that I feel like have the most weight and kind of wonder for me about is it is is it this character's play is it this character's journey is it this character's story our hero and then james which is kind of a weird character to kind of hold up to the same level as hero and yet uh, in terms of like whose play it is and yet he has a significant number of scenes in this play where he's all by himself talking to the aa group and he, and he, as as you said, he kind of is is the source of information for what's going on in the world around. And he has a they're a big, little expositiony, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then he has the big reveal at the end, where like uh, it's a it's a significant moment of stagecraft at the end to kind of have trained us to believe that when James talks, he's talking in AA. Um, to then have the reveal be, in fact, this last one is at the funeral of Masako. So, so he, he's, it's just interesting to kind of note the weight of these two characters. And I wonder what you think, uh, Jacob around. Yeah. Uh, I don't, again, I don't think it's really helpful to say this is so-and-so's play. And yet these two characters do carry a lot of weight. Yeah, I, I totally. And, and in some ways 
it's the future of the relationship between those two that is really at question. And and when we talk about the future of the whole family, you know, especially because Hiro has has really deliberately estranged herself from the family for so long, the the future of the family unit is at question. And also because, of course, Masako might I mean might die. And in yeah. fact, you get the feeling that that is the expectation. Um, yeah. That the optimism that they put on is genuine optimism and hope, but is also kind of genuine optimism and hope in the face of the reality of her situation. So while the whole group is is certainly in contention, it's the the sort of microcosm example of that is the relationship between James and Hero. What is going to happen there? the The first act is you know the big source of of um, let's say the big defining thing in the first act is her missing the meeting about the rocks. And then as you described the really awesome scene where he carries in this big bag of rocks and slams yeah. <laughs> it into the, into the hospital room. And then the sort of big defining thing in the second scene to me is this moment where hero opens up to her sister about how her, her about her feeling, um, shame or guilt at her own inability to forgive her father, you know, for right or for wrong. And, and so it, it's that, you know, what's going to happen there that is that is a big question mark. But it, it's also strange to me because the title scene, the title doesn't come from a scene with either of those two characters in it. Yeah. The title comes from one of the several sort of small, lovely moments where Sophie prays with her mother. Um, across the course of the scene. And she, there's a scene in which she sort of gives her mother a sort of liturgy, a sort of invented kind of scripture about uh, God healing, basically healing her. And it's a sort of ref- a repeated refrain about what God said. And from that, we get the title. Yeah, yeah, that's that's another good point. Like, as far as like uh, <laughs> significant script writing or analysis, um, uh, a significant portion of the dramatic <laughs> dramatic content is shifted into that scene as well for 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 the for the title of the play being in that one. Um, I, and I, I like what you said too about the relationship between Hero and James being a, a core part of the play because that's also the final lines of the play is uh, uh, so- Sophie and during that scene where uh, Sophie and Hero are kind of reconnecting and and talking to each other, Sophie notes um, that she's done a lot of work trying to figure out what James's la- uh, kind of love language is or how he how he expresses his love for them. And she talks about how whenever he got home from one of his or when he, whenever he wrapped up one of his episodes of drunkenness, he would say, I'm going to the store. Do you want anything? Um, and, and of course they would always say no or something like that, or, or just, or just move on from a not understanding. But Sophie names that as the way that he would say, I'm sorry, I love you. And he would always, even though they said no, bring them back a candy bar or something like that, which was again, his way of saying, though he couldn't at the time or wouldn't at the time, depending on how you interpret that. Um, he couldn't say, I love you. And so the last, the last scene, the last moments, last lines of the play is him repeating exactly that. Um, they're at the funeral. They're trying to kind of process the grief of the moment. And he says, well, I'm going to run to the grocery store because we're probably not going to eat for a, for a while <laughs> or something like that. And can I get you anything? And both Sophie and Hero say yes. And he kind of questioningly says, says okay, well, all right, then I'll go off and get it. Um, so you have this moment of like, well, at least there, there are like they're talking on the same wavelength or they, they understood each other in that moment. At least hero understood. Yeah, James. You could sort of say that she hero has plugged into his love language. Yeah. Um, the, the last thing that maybe I, I want to say that I feel like is important is that I think perhaps in our conversation about the play, we have um, maybe unfairly phrased this play as if the the sense of the play is that the family ought to forgive the years of abuse and trauma that James inflicted on them and and I I do I just want to make clear that not only is that not what we think about abusive situations but it it's also I, that is not the perspective that the play takes. If if that is what has come out in our conversation, I do think that that is the question of the play. 
is this something that the daughters can accept and that Masako can accept as, you know, having come out of it since their father has seemed to pull himself out of this hole and is trying to sort of rebuild his personality and his life. I do think it is the question of the play. Can these characters make something new of their life and their relationship despite these years of hardness and abuse. But it, I do not believe that the flavor of the play is they ought to do that, that there is some sort of expectation that abuse survivors forgive their abusers and it's all just hunky-dory. Rather, the, the amount of complexity and hardship is really recognized in the play, that this is this is such a terrible situation for all the things, the cancer included, the need to recover from alcoholism included. I mean, there, there's a really lovely Frank moment where they talk about how it's totally unfair that their dad had this sort of miracle healing of his liver and their mom can't, who's a, you know, seems to be a perfectly wonderful human being by almost all respects. She can't seem to get any of that. So there is a complexity around the question that is not moralizing uh, the sort of, you know, ought to or should that maybe comes through. It, it's hard to talk about these plays because it's hard it to is a question analyze of, it, yeah. right. It is a question of will they forgive James? Can they move forward in their relationship? But I think you can have that question without layering on they should or they ought to. For sure. Yeah. And, and what the character's desires are also plays into that as well um, without making it a should or it's, it's a good, good qualification for sure. And Masako yearns that this wasn't the case, I think, is the other piece that really makes this the center point of the center point of them coming home to take care of Masako is Masako longs for this to have not have happened the way it did. Um, and so even, even though that it's even, even, even with the knowledge <laughs> that, that, that she, she wishes for something else, um, it's none of the characters shy away from the reality of what their relationship has been in the past. So it's, it's, there's so much that I think we, I feel like we have another half hour of conversation that we could talk about with this play. It yeah. draws out. Well, we didn't so like, much. we didn't talk much about Sophie at all. We didn't talk much yeah. about Masako at all. I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> great stuff in this play. It's true. This this play really delves into a really intense moment, four days in a family's life around a really um, uh, significant moment for them all. So uh, fortunately, though, and that's I mean, another thing. I, I Sorry, <laughs> but that's just like in terms of like when you set this play in the course of this family's life. It's so interesting that it's set around the moment where Masako finishes her chemo. It's not around the moment where she like has a surgery yeah. the tumor. It's not around a moment that is like 100% going to define whether she's healthy or not going forward because we learn, of course, that she died from the cancer later on in the play. It's not about the moment where James finally comes out of his alcoholism. I mean, it's it's set it's clearly set to tell us that the story of this play is can this family, again, the question, without moralizing, the question of can this family come together in this moment of real hardship despite all the hardship that came before? And it's, I mean, it's just fascinating to me that this, this, these four days are the four days that uh, Winkler chose to tell us about. It, it is. There's 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 lots of little pieces of that again, like the one interaction we drilled on that was that felt like there was like six or seven layers deep um, <laughs> uh, of of sort of what was going on in the scene. So much going on and so many because of the 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 kind of full family that it is. Um, there's so much to identify with and and different things to pull out um, from 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 the script, from your own story. So it's a great one to keep talking about. We're at the end of our time for this episode but we'd love to encourage continued conversation around this play with all of you out there in podcast land. Um, if you have been in this play, read this play, seen this play, have heard about it for this first time, having listened to the podcast and just want to process some of the, the some of the content, we'd love to be those this sort of space that allows for further conversation about plays. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at the username at NoScript Podcast. We also have a Gmail, noscriptpodcast at gmail.com. Find us on any of those sites, and we'd love to keep talking about God Said This with you. 
Absolutely. If you like this conversation or any of our other conversations, please recommend the podcast to your family, your friends, anybody you know that likes theater, scripts, stories, just good discussions about complex situations. Send them our way. We are on Podbean. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, and other places that you find podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook, and you'll see a link to the new episode posted when we publish every Monday. And join us next week for Mini Month Part 2. Here we go, jumping into the themed month. It's exciting. Hope you're excited as well. Until next week when we're talking about another one of theater's best scripts. I'm Jackson Nikolai. I'm Jacob Mann Christensen. Thanks for joining us for No Script. <laughs>